everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming out and joining us tonight for this WGA Genre Committee event. Uh, my name is Kelly Jo Brick. I'm the vice chair of the Genre Committee, uh, where we celebrate all things genre. We have horror like tonight. Uh, we do things from thrillers to action to sci-fi to rom-coms. Uh, we meet every other month, and we would love to have you come check out our committee. Our next meeting is coming up on Tuesday, December 6th. Uh, and you can find out more on the Guild calendar. Please come check it out. Uh, first, want to give a huge thank you to all our panelists for joining us tonight. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out uh, to come and be part of this event and also for your generosity and sharing your experiences. <laughs> Also, a thank you to John Allen Simon for bringing this event, uh, inspiring this idea and putting the event together. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce you to our moderator for tonight, John Allen Simon. Thanks, Kelly Joe. Hi, everyone. Thanks for turning out, even though it's not a full moon, which isn't coming up, I guess, till November 9th. However, we, we already have a very scary event, which is uh, evidently uh, uh, Elon Musk's deal for Twitter has gone through and he's already fired a bunch of people there as of a few minutes ago, according to a CNN brief. So uh, the scares are not all going to be on the panel tonight. But um, I want to thank uh, Dwayne Johnson Cochran and Kelly Jo Brick, who chair the committee, and also my friend Patrick Flynn for helping put together the trailers that we're going to be showing of our panelists uh, really terrific movies. And also Greg Mitchell, who's our uh, committee liaison with the Writers Guild, very passionate about movies and integral to making these events happen for us. So, um, and of course, thank you to our panelists for coming out of their crypts of creative work to uh, chat with us about very important topic of werewolves. And uh, I think we'll, we'll begin a little bit on a serious note, although uh, we will degenerate very quickly and metamorphosize into a more rowdy view of the genre. But um, I'm doing a little research for this. Uh, we can't show you any clips from the first werewolf movie called The Werewolf, which was a silent movie in 1913 that's disappeared like so many other uh, silent movies but about a Navajo woman who turns into a wolf, which I guess is really in keeping with the whole uh, spirit shifting uh, aspect of werewolves. The first real sort of feature film to gain any notoriety was uh, Werewolf of London in 1935, which established a lot of the classic rules we'll be talking about. But I think probably most folks, including me would agree that uh, sort of the high point of the classic werewolf movies of yore was uh, 1941's The Wolfman with uh, Lon Chaney Jr., which was part of Universal's amazing monster cycle of Dracula and Creature of the Black Lagoon and the Invisible Man. So um, I think we'll begin a little bit on a uh, kind of, as I said, a more serious note, which is uh, I'd like to hear why are werewolves scary? And is there something unique about werewolves as opposed to just other creatures and things that go bump in the night? Uh, why don't we go around the panel, maybe begin with uh, Wesley. You know, I guess werewolves are scary because they're hairy. <laughs> Enough said. Then I must be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well. They're the hairiest of the monsters, I guess. Well, no, that's not true. We've got the missing link, which John Landis gave us in his very first feature film, Schlock. Uh, Danny, why are werewolves scary? Uh, well, I mean, there's the big teeth as well as the hair. And uh, I think it's just that uh, we try to push down all of our animal instincts and we're suppressing the caveman, the reptilian brain, and then, you know, we we like stories about shapeshifters and people being un, unable to control these urges and this violence, and it's beasts that uh, lose control and, and burst out of themselves and change into the monster, into the beast that we were at one time. 
I mean, I, I think about being eaten is also a very <laughs> primal thing. And John's movie uh, scared the crap out of me when I snuck in the theater and saw it. So uh, <laughs> American World in London. So that's my take. John, any philosophical thoughts? Why are werewolves scary? Yeah, and how are they different than other scary creatures? Is there oh, well, something intrinsically differently frightening about werewolves as opposed to vampires and ghosts and demons? And Well, they're all, um, none of them are scary to me, but uh, <laughs> like psycho killers, like, you know, Norman Bates and Hannibal, and they're scary because they're real. But uh, if you create the suspension of disbelief to believe the story's happening to hopefully sympathetic people that you care about, I think there's loss of control. I mean, there are, you mentioned uh, Drac, I'm sorry, uh, the Wolfman as creating some rules. The rules of every, every movie, I mean, every single one and every book and anything that deals with the supernatural the rules are set up in each book. They're not constant. It's not real. So everyone fools around with it. And the uh, I think the most frightening aspects of being a werewolf, Kurt Siodmak, who wrote The Wolfman, basically invented a lot of what we have come to believe is ancient mythology and superstitious lore. But he did something interesting. Werewolves before for that were pretty terrifying people like um, well Jekyll and Hyde I mean it was the evil self coming out it was a form of humanity and bestiality but the reality that Seildmach did he turned the wolf man into a victim I mean he, he didn't want to be a werewolf in the book Dracula he changes himself into a wolf at will He's and a shapeshifter right from the start. Whatever. Yeah, which is all kinds of people could do, turn into a wolf. It was the whole idea that he was, he didn't want it. He's not interested. And the savagery of the monster itself has nothing to do with him. Uh, nothing to do with him. Cheney's always waking up the next morning and go, where was I last night? And he wants to die. I mean, he's not interested in killing people. So I was taken with the whole concept of werewolf as victim, like anthropy as disease. Mm -hmm. Mishnah? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, just being, trying to be courteous. Um, I'm in the John camp a little bit. I always thought if I was going to do a werewolf movie, it was going to be funny because... Uh, I, it, it's not a particularly scary creature to me so much as it's relatable. Um, you know, it, it's a really relatable monster. I think we all struggle with our appetites in one way or another and, you know, sort of social expectations. And, you know, the werewolf sort of represents a person who's just like, you know, s s screw it. I'm, uh, you know, I, I can't hold it in. Um, so... I think, um, you know, th th there's also like an insatiability that's that's fun about a werewolf. But one of the things that always struck me in looking at werewolf lore is, is the, the, the angry mob around, you know, the fear that it incites in other people. And you, we were talking earlier, you were talking about the werewolf, of course, is kind of a metaphorical version of puberty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which goes back to Harry. To Wesley Strick's very it's uh, more, it's more pointed than, comment. Succinct. Forget it, can can I speak for a second? Of course. It, it's more than just uh, Harry. The idea of puberty and adolescence is exactly the correct metaphor because everyone, man and woman, goes through physical changes. Their body gets hairier. They grow. The girls grow breasts. The men. I mean, it's weird what happens to a teenager. Don't I mean, gender stereotype, please, John. A teenager is not gender stereotyping anybody. All boys and girls and whatever all go through physical changes. Real things happen. Hair starts growing out your face. 
I mean, it's not a hard jump. Heather? Heather, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was thinking of Jekyll and Hyde as well, like when John, or, and then John brought that up. But I think, you know, from the, from an audience point of view, I think part of what's scary is that the unpredictability of it, it's not black or white, right? Like you, you don't introduce like, it's not monster all the time. And so it doesn't let your mind do the easy thing of like, good and evil right away let me get clear on like who i hate and who i love in this story like there's complexity to it because it lives in the gray and there's all and it also gives you this um automatic built-in tension of the when question right which is such a great question to provoke audiences to ask to in something that you want them to be scared about and so it, it is kind of that jekyll and hyde of like who am i getting right now and and this this lurking thing could happen at any moment. And so it it makes the audience vulnerable in the same way that I think, you know, we're kind of vulnerable as people. Like we have these automatic ways that we meet people, and then we have these, you know, our brains are doing all this filing all the time, like, oh, okay, let me put this person into this stereotype. Now I know who they are. This is easy. This is how I work with them. This is what I think of them. This is what I believe about them. And it's not true, but it's kind of what we tend to do. So when you throw a character at people that they can't do that with and that forces them to, you know, kind of stay with them through these different moments, then especially if you're kind of being provocative about each side of that, you know, personality or whatever, then that's scary because, you know, the audience is kind of never getting comfortable, really. Um, yeah. And Michael. You, yeah. were, you and I were talking a little bit about uh, werewolf lycanthropy as sort of a metaphor for substance abuse. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've seen it less as, um, as puberty, but more as, more as a reference to alcoholism and drug addiction. You wake up the next morning, you're not sure what you did. You were totally out of control. People tell you you did something awful. You, you, you're totally unresponsible and you don't have any memory of it. To me, um, it's releasing all the things that I think werewolves are possibly one of the very scariest of the monsters. Um, I appreciate that a vampire is strong, but he gets one person and he feeds on it. You look at the mummy, you look at Frankenstein, dude, I could outrun those guys and I'm a big guy. So I'm not worried about it. Same thing with zombies. They're not fast. These, a werewolf, <laughs> now that now they, they are. They were in World War Z. Since, since World War Z <laughs> and, and the Z, zombie, uh, t the other t zombie TV show after, um, uh, after Walking Dead. But think about this though. Not only are they fast as an animal think about the fact that a wolf <laughs> a wolf can outrun me a dog can outrun me uh, they can chase me down and once they rip something apart they don't have to stay with it they don't just kill one thing they s tear something down and will go and tear out the next three things they're not doing it for food or substance they're doing it in a ravage craze of insanity of insatiable bloodlust it's not like many of the other monsters because it defies logic. They're not trying to accomplish something. They just need to tear stuff apart. So I, I, werewolves to me have always been one of the most exciting and scary of the classic creatures. And that's why I was thrilled to do it. And also the idea of the metamorphosis, the, 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 the puberty angle. I mean, the truth is, is, and we're all going to be referring back to this, but you know, John's American werewolf in London, that, tra that transformation changed my life cinematically. That, that first watching a character transform from man into werewolf in that way, I saw the pain, the agony, his skin is stretching, his nails are growing, and it's not just hair, his mu musculature was changing, his fingers were stretching horrifying and, and, and yeah no I, I i anybody who says they're not scared of werewolves is simply way too logical <laughs> just because they don't exist doesn't mean they're not scary <laughs> again well, i just want to point out that jekyll and hyde which immediately comes to mind is much more about you could say alcoholism because mm. the serum the serum whatever you call it the drug yeah that Dr. Jekyll takes 
uncovers his own lust and you know the primitive sense that the great Frederick March movie, the Ruben Mamouli and Jekyll and Hyde, which I strongly recommend if no one's seen it. Um, only man to ever win an Oscar for playing a monster. But anyway, he, you know, in alcoholism, yeah, there's a lot of great metaphors to be made, but the guy chooses to drink alcohol mm. and suffers for the result. What I liked about, well, Kurt Seelmach was the first one to do it, but the idea of the werewolf is he's not choosing to do it. He doesn't want to do it. He has nothing. And the beast that you're right is shredding people out there has nothing to do with him or his desires. Nothing. Exactly. Well, let's go to a let's go to a, a more personal fun question. Tell us about your first scary movie. Doesn't have to be a werewolf movie. Uh, let's start. Uh, let's start the going the other way around, Michael. Uh, for me, it, it was my brother. He used to like to, when my parents were gone, put on things that would horrify me. So for me, it was, um, was it Dawn of the Dead, the one in the mall I'm thinking about? Yeah, the one that's the, color, the mall one. The remake one by Romero that, that I just remember zombies, the guy screaming and zombies ripping out their intestines and eating them over the over the guy <laughs> screaming, still alive. And it was in color as opposed to the original Night of the Living. Yeah, Night. exactly. Color it it made it just so viscerally disturbing. It was Is it Dawn of the Dead, the Zack Snyder one? No, Zack no, Snyder, that's the his one is the remake of George Romero's original movie. That Dario Argento also Dawn? collaborated Dawn? on. No? Isn't that one Dawn? Dawn of the Dead is the title of George Romero's movie. Zack oh. Snyder remade it with the same title. Oh, he did? Same. Okay. I thought there was Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead. You're right. There's also Day of the Dead. Okay. There was the Night original of the was Night of the Living Dead, though. Night, Night of, of the, the Living, Living Dead. Dead. Day of the That's Dead. Some might argue is still the best of, of mm -hmm. any of the dead. <laughs> I would think so. Heather, your scary movie experience, your first one for Halloween. For, I was just thinking like, I mean, The Shining is like always been up there for me. And then I was thinking like, is that really that early? But I have two older brothers and one of them is a decade older than me. And so my experience with the things that I watched young were just like, I just shouldn't have been watching any of them. So I think I was... Yeah, I think I think that one to this day is like, uh, you know, like hard hard to get through. Um, also, Poltergeist is another great one where it's like kind of the that one is a little bit more enjoyable fear for me as an adult. But both of those, as when I was younger, were you know haunting, can't sleep level for sure. Mishnah. Oh, um, I think my first, first scary movie was Them, the 1954 um, giant ant movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, I loved, I, I saw it when I, I must have been like six or seven years old. When That's I saw a good it. movie. It's a great movie. And I, the opening scene will always stay with me. They just, you know, they find the little girl in the, the she's passed out and they give her the spelling salts and she goes so hysterical in this doctor's office i think i'm remembering it correctly that you it's such a great introduction to a creature you're going to see later because her reaction to the creature sort of sets you up for you're like oh this is going to be a really scary creature and john well the first i don't actually no, my first horror film, but the first, because, you know, we used to see Million Dollar Movie on television and see all the classics on that. But I think the first time I ever really was nah, in a movie, I went with my two older sisters to the Fox at Westwood Village to see a double feature of King Kong versus Godzilla, which I really enjoyed. My sisters hated it. And uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. The uh, big with Pat rock, Boone. With Pat that Boone and James Mason. And there's a scene in that at the very beginning when they go off 
on the expedition and they climb the volcano, which is now extinct volcano, and they get to the point of looking down the funnel that they're going to descend. And Mason lights a torch and they all lean over and he tosses the torch and you just see it falling for an extraordinary amount of time before it finally just disappears. And I remember thinking, yeah, it really kind of disturbed me. But I, I'm an easy one to get scared. It's easy to scare me. Doesn't mean it's good, just means I'm scared. Danny, early scary film. I mean, I used to go to Saturday to matinees and um, I've watched a lot of, uh, because I lived overseas, I watched a lot of the black and white classics, but I think the first movie that really, really scared me at the theater was Jaws. And my father regretted taking me to see it. I mean, fantastic movie, but scared me bad. Wesley. Well, I'm going to embarrass myself now because, I mean, like John uh, Landis, I, I watch a lot of horror flicks on Million Dollar. I mean, that's, it's a little different than going to the theater and being, you know, fully immersed in the in the in the theory. But uh, and uh, I remember the Crawling Eye as being a particularly frightening Million Dollar movie that was seemed to be on repeat. Um, endlessly and I, I would indulge in that but the movie in the theater that terrified me was a film and I'm I'm, I'm not putting you on when I say that it was um well first of all it was I went with uh, friends to uh, it was one of my pals I think seventh birthday so a bunch of us guys went to the theater to see uh, a film that proved so terrifying to all of us I think we were all whimpering in our seats that they literally had to stop the film, turn on the house lights and escort us out. And for years after that, ex that traumatizing experience, I would ask people my age if they had seen the movie, if they were familiar with it. N nobody had at that point. Uh, it didn't, the title didn't register with anyone. And it was called Plan 9 from Outer Space, <laughs> which later became famous as the, the worst movie ever Terrifyingly made. Terrifyingly bad. Yeah, but we didn't realize that at age seven. We were ter we were legit terrified. Um, and in my mind, for 10, 15 years, until it won the Golden Turkey Award in, in that book in, I think, 1980, as the worst movie of all time, I was convinced that there was this sort of now... I thought maybe it had been withdrawn from circulation but because it was too scary. Um, so I, I learned... Uh, that I was wrong, uh, you know, and this is decades before Ed Wood became a camp icon. So that, you know, that was my initiation into horror film cinema. It's horror. hard. It's hard when you, I know that movie pretty well and I can't imagine what scared you in that. Well, I was seven. I don't know. You know, it was the graveyard. It was, there was something morbid and macabre about it that, I mean, all of his cheesy effects worked their magic on me or their black magic. On me. it was just, it, it, and maybe it was a case of group hysteria. All of us just lost our, you know. Well, you brought your own imagination to it, obviously. For, for me, yeah, it was Invasion I, of the Body Snatchers with the original yeah. one, yeah. seeing uh -huh. it on TV, yeah. and it scared the scared the crap out of me. And, sure. you know, you go back and look at another one that scared me was The Time Machine, George Pal's movie with the, the Morlocks, and they, they just look silly today. You know, you again, like like John was saying, or you were saying, Wesley, that uh, you know what scares you as a kid can be very different than what you would uh, find scary yeah. now. And now yeah. for a scare, which is I'm going to try to share the screen and play our first trailer, which is going to be Werewolf by Night, and we'll talk a little with Heather Quinn about it. It's streaming right now, as of just a couple weeks ago on uh, Disney, right, Heather? Yep, Disney Plus. Okay, all right, so give me a moment, folks. So you were already working for Marvel on Hawkeye, uh, and so that was your earlier experience there. And this is a corner of the Marvel universe that probably only hardcore fans are really aware of. Is it is it called like Monster Hunters? What is it? What is it known as? 
Um, you mean this whole area of yeah of the of the I, MCU? I don't know. I don't know if there's a term for all of it. I mean, there are. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of think it's just I refer to it as almost just kind of like the darker underworld of it. But I don't, I don't even know if there's really like popular language yet because we're kind of just at least for the cinematic experience because this is kind of the forefront of it. Well, talk a little bit about how you came on board it and pitched it and what the conception was, how much of this retro aspect of it was uh, in your teleplay and how much of that was uh, something that kind of came in as a production choice. But you were also a producer, so you had a, a voice in that too. Yeah. Um... So yeah, I was writing on um, Hawkeye. We were shooting, I was on set for uh, prin all principal of, for all the episodes of Hawkeye. So uh, that was, and then, so, so I was writing on that and we were shooting in Atlanta when um, they asked me if I wanted to pitch on this one. So I was um, running out to the, whoever's trailer I could find from scenes and <laughs> trying to give my best take of a, of a, of a werewolf story during that. So that's kind of how I started pitching. I found out that I got it when I was there. So then I got back from Hawkeye and, and just kind of jumped straight into this with, with Michael um, Giacchino, who he and I really broke the whole thing together. Um, and as far as the conceit, you know, we knew, so um, I guess for those, I, I'm gonna speak as if not everyone knows everything uh, about Marvel or this movie, but, so, you know, these are all new characters in this movie, as well as kind of a new corner of the Marvel genre, at least for the screen. And so we knew we had Jack and Elsa, um, uh, you know, and we knew that we wanted them to, to make some sort of unlikely alliance. Like we knew that was going to be kind of the team up, right? And we also knew we had an hour. Um, and so, you know, Elsa in the comics is the daughter of the most famous monster hunter, Ulysses Bloodstone. And um, and Jack is a werewolf. Spoiler. Fuck you guys. I'm sorry. Did I just spoil? <laughs> um, I think we but, figured uh, that out pretty quickly. <laughs> I'll still watch. Conversation... You'll still watch. Thank God. What's Kyle in that movie? No, but um. So yeah, we knew we wanted them to make this alliance, and that was a that was I think the heart of the story of of new where we knew we had to get because we wanted to you know in fifty three minutes, which I feel like writers will appreciate more than anyone else. It's like feels like a tall order to be like, hey, introduce three new characters to the MCU, explain monsters exist, make sure we all kind of understand this world we're in, and make two characters that hate each other at the beginning or at least judge each other sort of be cool with each other later, and then make you know what I mean. It was like. <laughs> so you know I always felt like the heart of the heart of it was making sure that we bought that relationship between the two of them um and then as far as what you said about you know the the kind of old throwback feel um you know I think so much of that I feel like really starts coming to life in production and then all of course these amazing artists that we were getting to work with who I think just did such a beautiful job um but some of the things that were on the page and also we're always in our minds is that is to, were a lot of you know the director's choices but like that there was going to be as much practical as we possibly could we kept saying like we want this to feel like an independent movie that gets marvelly at the end we were always like can we have no special effects until the last five minutes like we were we we knew we wanted it to feel super grounded and in that way kind of be more throwback right we didn't want to play visual tricks on the audience um, we wanted it to stay very emotional. We wanted the transformation to wait. So we spent time with him as a human for a long time before. Um, and, and again, playing with what I was mentioning earlier about the when question, right? Which anytime you're writing a werewolf movie, that's like front and center. All right, well, when does it fucking happen? Um, and um, so, yeah, some of the throwback was doing in things, doing things very practically. And, um, and then visually almost like a simplicity to it where I guess that kind of speaks to the visual effects as well but like um I guess on the page it's almost like the style of fear or the the uh the tone of the fear I think is older than some like new more um thriller fear you know which I think feel like I think the older feels a little bit more like it has a little bit more tongue-in-cheek it's a little bit more like um 
it's not quite campy, but you know, it's, it's, it's different than kind of a thrill. So I, I kind of knew that was the tone of the fear that we were going, going for. Um, and, and then also you have those jokes in there, right? So you're kind of not leaving the audience like terrified for too long. I guess that's kind of what I mean about the thriller feel. Like you're not really leaving them. You're not letting them stay there super long for, for too long of the time, except that they should care about who might get hurt. But Did, did um, you have a sense of, of what you wanted to do with the werewolf, something different than, or did you want to just play on our already what most people think of as the monstrous, uh, savage aspect of the werewolf? As far as um, like the personality, you mean? Well, as far as the characterization, how you wanted to present the werewolf. He's very much like what John was saying. He's a victim. Yeah. He doesn't really want to be a werewolf. Doesn't want yeah. to tear people apart. He does everything he can to prevent it. Is that the main thing you wanted to convey? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the ways that I always, like, you know, I, I, I guess I'd be interested what the other writers think about this, but like, I, you know, a lot of time when I was, when I'm, was thinking about writing him, you know, I wasn't really thinking about like a monster. I'm thinking about like, the, or the way that I'm trying to access those feelings of the experience are like, what does it feel like to hold a secret? What does it feel like? Like I'm thinking of things like trauma from, you know, hereditary trauma or kind of like John was saying, like the things like the aspects that you cannot control, like he has inherited this and that this is his bad, you know, this is his baggage to carry one way or another. So I've, so I was thinking about all the emotional experiences that all of us have and what those do to us and the shame or fear or judgment or, um, you know, all of those things that can come into play and also how you're seen within that, within that secret and that trauma. And so um, that's a verbose way of saying, um, yeah, it was always from a place of sympathy from him and always and trying to give, we, we knew we wanted to be on his side. So it's like, um, yeah, how to let people into that in a way that feels relatable that like, sure, you're watching a werewolf, but what you're actually feeling is kind of like somehow like it's very familiar to you, which is maybe kind of funny. Um, well, that's, and then that's, I think yeah. and I think part of that also, of course, became like some of Gael's choices. And once he came on and was, um, you know, of course, like, how is he going to embody this, especially for someone that's going to kind of like do be, you know, be playing these two characters, what were his choices and his beliefs, and then kind of sewing that into what we already had. Um, and, you know, like, and I think that shaped a lot of it too, of course. Well, that's great. Yeah, it's really fun. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Next up, we're going to show you. what's probably I guess I would have to say it's the classiest werewolf movie I've ever seen, given the casting and the uh, the filmmaker. Uh, we have Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer and Christopher Plummer and James Spader in uh, the Mike Nichols film Wolf, written by Wesley Strick, who was already a very distinguished screenwriter when he came on board that he'd done Batman Returns and Cape Fear for Scorsese, the remake, and Arachnophobia uh, for Frank Marshall. Fun, really fun, scary movie. Mm -hmm. So we're going to show a clip, and uh, it's only a minute. So Wesley, um, you were telling me, and I think it's pretty well known, that this began with uh, the novelist Jim Harrison and Jack Nicholson going out drinking and howling at the moon one night this story evolved yeah. that why don't you pick up from from there how you became yeah that, that's what I was told um by Nichols that Jim Harrison uh and his good friend Jack were just holed up in uh, Jim's uh, cabin in Montana drinking through the night and uh, at dawn or no before dawn I guess in the wee hours they stumbled out into the snow or um you know in this remote area and just started howling at spontaneously howling at the moon and and the next morning decided there was a, a movie there somehow and uh sold the idea to sony pictures uh, jim wrote the original screenplay that i worked off of and and jim you know is a great novelist and he, he actually published his first novel i think was called wolf but it's not connected to the movie at all this is a separate original project. Um, and after I think working with Jim on a couple of drafts, they realized or decided that they needed a, 
a professional screenwriter, and that was me. Um, so I, you know, I was handed this script that was interesting. I mean, the basic kind of outline of the story was was there, although uh, Nicholson played a lawyer in the in in uh, Harrison's original script, and I the, one of the first changes I made was to make him a book editor because I thought if he's if Jack Nicholson's going to turn into a wolf, he has to start. You have to push him back away so uh, there's nothing wolf like about him and Nicholson has you know vulpine characteristics as a person I think as an actor so I, I felt it was important to establish him as, as at least working in a genteel kind of profession in a social milieu that was also very civilized and that I think that helped helped a lot um, but you know the original script was a little dense and without um, shape it didn't have the you know, three three act screenplay structure or or anything like like what you know you you're looking for in a movie script. So I, we had to shape it. Um, and and I would I will say that Nichols had never made a monster movie before, and he was excited about it. But he was also you know he had a some fears and reservations I think about doing straight genre. So he was always asking me. What's the secret of the movie is as we were developing it? Is it um is it an allegory about AIDS? Is it about the death of God? I mean, he would throw out these ideas. And I, I continually found my, myself saying, no, no, it's not that. It isn't that. But I couldn't really um provide a good answer for him. And I think we flailed a little bit in that, in that regard. And um after I haven't I hadn't seen the movie in years after I agreed to do this panel. So just in the last week, I rewatched the movie and to refresh my memory. And suddenly what the movie was all this time jumped out at me. And, and the answer is so obvious that I feel ridiculous. But um, it's about age and it's about thwarting the depredations and losses of age. Uh, Nicholson was a man in his mid 50s at the time. Jim Harrison was also that age. Mike Nichols was in his early 60s. Um, and I think what they, they were all personally, privately looking at was, you know, um, they were on the all on the brink of going from late middle age into genuine senior citizenship. And I think that was, that was preying on them. I, I didn't think about it much because I was in my 30s at the time. But when I watch it now, and, and at this stage, I'm older than all three of those guys were at the time. And then and now it's so clear to me that, you know, when you reach a certain age, you begin to fear the loss of status, of um, relevance, of vitality, of sexual energy, all of that. It's, it starts to disappear or it's taken away from you um, by competitors uh, in society. You know, the James Spader character, for instance. Who's not only gunning for Nicholson's job, but but making it with his wife. So, it you know, to me, it's 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 like at the opposite end of puberty, um, the wolf uh, metaphor. And one of the things that you I and I were, but he's sorry. he's regaining strength. Uh, it's a kind of wish fulfillment uh, movie with a hint, with a touch of um, cautionary tale. Of course, uh, in other words, at what price do you get all of this back? Uh, and it's of course it's also only temporary uh, before you descend into um, pure wildness and lose your humanity altogether. But there is that period where we're rooting for Jack. Um, we we love the fact that he can take revenge on his uh, and smite his enemies and all of that and uh, catch his wife out in her infidelity and and get involved in a in a relationship that plays very inappropriately now with Michelle Pfeiffer who is quite quite a bit younger than Jack but 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 uh that's how it landed for me just watching it in the in the last week My I was favorite. also sorry I was also thinking that uh Iron John was sort of a thing right around then sort of the new yeah it was masculinity absolutely. yeah and and that was certainly a theme of, of Jim Harrison's um manhood um, which again was something, and and the machismo uh, theme, which again was something I, you know, I didn't really particularly tap into, just being the um, sort of Democrat, New York raised Democrat that I am. But um, but I, but I, and so I always felt, oh, I was kind of faking it there um, in, in terms of dramatizing the the masculinity theme. But now that I watched it again, I, I really 
feel that it's about trying to reverse the depredations of, of age. Um, and if, if only for one last hurrah, you know. I love the scene with James Spader in the men's room where they're marking their territory. Yeah, no, that's... I was just going to bring that up. Is that your favorite? That's my favorite scene in the movie. What's, yeah, what's your no, that, That's a great moment. That uh, I have to give credit where it's due. That was Jim Harrison. My my sort of big uh, funny line in the movie was I'm not just a you know a member of the hair club, a president of the hair club. I'm a member, and he sort of doffs his hair. But but you know the the fact that Nicholson, I think as a movie star, was you know um, conspicuously struggling with a receding hairline for most of his career. I think we sort of used the, the drama of that and reversed it. So there's lots of close-ups of Jack with a very thick head of hair, you know, as we get into the third act. And I think, you know, thematically that sort of says it all. Our next trailer, I, I, someone suggested that I try a different player, that I try VLC. So this may be worse, but uh, in an effort to make things better, we often make things worse. That's a theme of uh, a lot of scripts <laughs> that I've been involved with. So uh, let's try that. We may get to see a little bit of the trailers we've already seen, uh, but we're gonna be seeing Danny McBride's uh, Underworld from 2003, hopefully, and hearing it. Danny, uh, so this was 2003 and you went on to be involved with two more Underworlds, Underworld. I made five. Well, you, oh, five are all a trip, but you were very involved with the first three, right? Yeah, the first one was a spec script, yeah. yeah. And um, so uh, I actually, a uh, director, Len Wiseman, had, we had the same agent. He called me and he said, you want to do a werewolf movie? And I said, uh, no, I wanted to do this ghost thing. And I said, the best werewolf movie was, was already made. Uh, American Werewolf in London. There is no making a werewolf movie. Uh, it was Rick Baker, I think, did all the. Uh, why even compete? And he said, "Why well, want to do something different?" And I, I started thinking about it, and I said, "Well, you know, why don't we do like a British war movie set in Eastern Europe and have gothic backdrop, and we'll do it all with viruses and you know, update it a bit." And of course, uh, I, I like John, I had been a stuntman in my youth. Uh, awful stuntman, but um, I, uh, a lot of my buddies were really good stuntmen and they had just got back from doing the Matrix and they were all doing the wired work, Chad Stahelski, Dave Leach, Brad Martin. And uh, so we wanted to do practical effects as much as possible and then have a lot of uh, wire work in it. And we actually needed the wire work because of the, the, the top heaviness of, of the creatures themselves. But, you know, we, I wanted to add a backstory that could do as a standalone movie. You know, when I went in, I was like, oh, we can make three movies out of this. And, and they were saying, let's just talk about the first movie. And uh, Lakeshore had uh, never done anything like this before they were doing rom-coms. And we went in and Len and I were both from low budget and student films. And we had learned exactly not how to make a low budget movie. And uh, so we were explaining, they believed us. And then the next thing you know, we were, we were in Budapest shooting and nobody spoke English. And it was, uh, so we had to bring British crew over. So the whole thing was, uh, have everything had to be translated. The first day I had uh, catering, it was like yak spine soaked in salt. It was, it was, uh, it, it almost gave me a stroke. And I was shooting second unit and splinter unit. And uh, when we switched to nights, I, I, I was, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. I'd wake up and, and go to the, uh, go. To, we were in a mall. People were walking by shopping. That's where our production office was. <laughs> And uh, I'd be in there watching dailies, you know, on VHS, and they they were all purple. Everybody looked like Oompa Loompas. They'd screwed up in, in Germany with the, you know, we wanted to desaturate it, but we didn't want it to look purple. And, uh, but, you know, Clint Culpepper over at Sony loved it. And uh, we ended up that sold a lot of DVDs. And Kate was about, I don't know, 28, 27 when she did it. Horrible that she had to wear that, you know, PVC suit. But the story-wise, we wanted something that was set with Carpathia as the background. 
and uh, making it that the, I, I decided I wanted it to be that the, the lichens, the lycanthropes had been the, uh, the daytime guardians of the vampires. You know, it made sense to me. So that's what we did. We created a lot of new kind of things. We still stuck with silver. We got rid of garlic. We stuck with daylight, took out all religious connotations, everything like that. But because it was an action movie, and this is before I started getting hired by HBO and places like that to write drama, you, you know, there's choices you have to make as a screenwriter. Uh, you know, how, how do you peel, uh, you know, if you watch something like Game of Thrones, you get eight seasons to peel that onion and then you got to jam it all into, you know, an hour and a half and with a lot of characters. So you have to get all the rules out of the way. You have to explain how the world works and set up the vibe of the world. But we just wanted it to be fun. And it was a popcorn movie from the beginning. And, and that's what I, I've seen lots of people with tattoos of it. And I remember telling uh, that they were doing something at Comic-Con. And I told the guy at Sony, I said, don't give anybody th these people my home address. You know, because some of them were <laughs> saying that they were vampires and that they wanted to be werewolves. And I was like, holy crap. You know, I think they expected me to have black fingernails and fangs or something. I, uh, I th it was interesting. It was, I, I, I who would have thought? And I, I sold uh, another screenplay that same week that I sold Underworld. I, I uh, Anton Fuqua came aboard. He had just done Training Day, and I walked into Disney and and sold the pitch to Nina Jacobson in the room. So after struggling for years with nothing, and I had written an Outer Limits you know and then I got two jobs in one week it, it was I thought I had been in an accident was in a coma and hallucinating which is sort of what I thought during the pandemic too but uh no it was a very interesting experience I would have never in a million years thought that I would do a uh, werewolf movie who and in terms of Nye? research huh? John do you want to uh no I just wondered who cast Bill Nye because he's wonderful. Oh, God, I mean, he cast himself. The guy was, he's amazing. Michael Sheen, amazing, Am amazing. It, it, it was, they were undeniable. Nobody knew who Michael Sheen was. Uh, Bill had not been seen. He had just finished shooting Love Actually, but nobody had seen it. And uh, I wanted there to be more comedy, and there was no comedy. And thank God Bill Nye was there to break the ice in some of the scenes and uh he, 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 such a great guy and it was a grueling shoot six days a week uh we did that movie for 16 i think 16 million and uh so it was the fact that they you know they made a lot of money off it so i was i was what happy about I mean, research on on werewolves did you do any well, did you think I, I about did, how you, know, you wanted to fifth, set that up well, in the, you know, I looked at the, the werewolf panic from the 1500s in France and, you know, almost like their Salem witch trials where they're burning people at the stake and all of this as werewolves. I also looked at, you know, I, I was toyed with the idea of making it during the Second World War with Nazis and werewolves. And uh, I, you know, probably from John's movie with, with the, the second dream sequence, which I've stolen many times with him waking up in the in the uh hospital bed and the and the uh the nazi comes out from behind the curtain uh the tricking people with dreams it's one of the best devices ever for the genre stuff but uh i did a lot of research on vampires and werewolves and i said i'm gonna ignore a whole bunch of it and i don't have enough time to i don't want every beat to be explaining the rules and, uh, you know, Sony's big thing was, how are you going to tell the difference between the two? I'm like, well, oh, the, the other ones are 10 feet tall and covered in hair. And they're like, no, when they're in human form. And I said, we're going to, that'll be wardrobe. You know, they'll figure out, a, you know, the, the, the lichens all wore brown and the, the vampires all wore black. But it was, uh, it was um, you know, I'm, I'm surprised it, it, it spawned a franchise. I, I, I mean, it, the last thing you ever think of happening. Um, not, I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying it, it, I, I would never have guessed it. You know, we, who knew? You never know how your movie's gonna be, you know, biting your fingernails when the weekend it comes out. 
Well, let's take a look at a movie everyone's been talking about so far <laughs> as having been influential and uh, that's uh, hopefully we'll hear the sound on it. We're going to try. We're trying here. I can tell you that. Uh, let's give a shot for an American werewolf in London. You know that I was concerned when we did the 4K and all that, you know, that it would, it was too clear and crisp for some of Rick's stuff. But in fact, it made it, it enhanced it to show us how good he is. Yeah, it looked great. Now you were coming off of having done Animal House, Blues Brothers, uh, and uh, of course, Kentucky Fried Movie, which you... Which was your uh, first real introduction to America's uh, hip young comedy audience. Uh, but this was hard to get made. They thought it was too scary to be funny and too funny to be scary. You wrote it like uh, 11 years before it got made, right? I wrote it in 1969 when I was working as a gopher. They're now called production assistants on a movie called Kelly's Heroes, which was a shot in Yugoslavia. And I wrote it then, and you're right. That was one of only two reactions I got. This is too scary to be funny, or this is too funny to be scary. And I don't mean it to be a comedy. I don't, you know, they call it a comedy horror. But in fact, I wanted it to be funny. I hope it's funny. But that's all there to enhance the horror, and it makes it scarier. Hmm. Um, and it was just... It got me a lot of work as a writer. They would read it and turn it down and then hire me to write something. <laughs> um, guy who loved, Cubby Broccoli, the, of blessed memory. But Cubby loved that script and hired me to be one of what turned out to be 11 or 12 writers of the spy who loved me. But I worked with Tony Burgess for a month. But anyway, Anthony Burgess. Um, but I kept saying to him, you know, you love this script so much. Why don't we make it? And his answer was always, don't be ridiculous. So it was only, you know, after Animal House and the Blues Brothers that I made it. And it was, you know, $10 million negative pickup. Polygram, a Dutch company, made it. And it goes back to the experience you had on the road in Yugoslavia, going uh, on location, right? To seeing some Rom Romani people, gypsies, <laughs> Gypsy burying I, someone. I've told the story millions of times. Yeah, but not to us and not, uh, not on October 27th, 2020. I told it to you. Um, actually, very quickly, I was being driven from Novi Sad to, no, from uh, Belgrade to Novi Sad, which is about 800 miles. Um, and on, you know, at that time in 69, there were very few cars in Yugoslavia. I'm not kidding. There were less than 5,000, I think in the country, Tito was still the head of the country and it was behind the iron curtain there, you know, guys with machine guns, and hammer and sickles, quite amazing, but it was one road. It just one lane. 800 miles, basically, lined with trees. Um, and a guy named Sasha was driving, and I was the passenger. And we were, he was Yugoslav and spoke five or six languages and was college-educated guy, rather sophisticated. And we came to it like, we've stopped. Why, huh? What's happening? And there was a dirt crossroads. Um, and in the crux of the cross there, there uh, they had dug a hole about nine foot deep and like four foot around. There were two Greek Orthodox priests, Greek Orthodox, you know, with the hats like that and the incense and the miter. And there were gypsies, 15 or so gypsies, and they totally looked like dress extras. It was really back lot thing. It was, it was so silly. And there was a body of a man wrapped in a shroud. And the shroud was then wrapped in uh, garlands of garlic, whole garlic. 
and rosaries. And when Sasha asked them, uh, pardon us, what's going on? The answer was, I don't know what the guy did. It was egregious. This guy was a bad guy. And they buried him. We had no choice but to watch. Feet first in the ground and then holy water and prayers and and the women really with babushkas and hoop earrings and it was nuts and uh they filled it in and then they poured asphalt over it and it was wild and then we were allowed to go and the week before the united states had landed a man on the moon and i kept thinking what are they what what is it they're scared of? And Sasha found the whole thing very funny. He just thought they were idiots. And he had lots of unpleasant words for Rome, Rome gypsies. And uh, I was just so fascinated. I kept thinking nothing in my, nothing in my experience, nothing. What would happen if, you know, that night, camera zooms in and fingers, you know, break the surface. And this guy has managed to get, climb. how would I deal with that? I mean, how, how would you deal with the impossible when it's in your face? And that's, you know, obviously, a, I, I thought about different monsters and stuff. And I came up with werewolves and I wrote werewolf. And the and I really based those two guys on me and my friend Greg when we were eighteen, and that's the story. What's the scene in the movie that you're proudest of? I think the scene I like the best from remembering it a long time ago is when you have that obligatory scene where uh, Griffin Dunn has come back and he's explaining, starting to explain to David Naughton, you know what's happened and. I have, a question. I have a question. Yeah. Why, how is that an obligatory scene? Where the obligatory, have you seen that before? The, oh, where people like ex, the expository scene that's then interrupted hilariously by by David Norton saying, I know what's going on. You know, you're the undead and I'm I'm, I'm gonna be a monster. And it cracked me up. I remember laughing the first time I saw it. The obligatory part is what you, you know, is what is what you changed it to Ex not, mean I mean, from from changed it from does that make more sense is that no more, more flattering no no it's not a question of flattering i'm just thinking how in any way was anyway it was you know every movie makes its own rules it mentioned silver for silver bullets that right. totally came from a, one of the wolf the second or third wolf man and it was because kurt sealmach his kid was listening to the Lone Ranger on the radio. And he thought, that's a good idea, silver bullets. And he had written that you melt a crucifix made of silver. Right. And they didn't do that. But that became suddenly a thing. How can you kill a werewolf with silver bullets? Why? Because Universal in the 40s said so. You know, it's so I just felt the whole thing is ridiculous. That's why it's funny. It is ridiculous it's 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 absurd on its face and it remains funny until your throat's being torn off well, you know, that's right. giant thing and that's that's why it's funny because it's how do you deal with something that is absolutely impossible what did you want to keep of werewolf what did you want to not keep of the werewolf uh, I won't call it mythology, but let's just say the tropes. Well, no, the, the werewolf mythology, the, you know, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, he could turn into a wolf at will. And he turned into a four-legged wolf. And traditional werewolves, all, uh, <laughs> uh, Danny mentioned the, the werewolf witchcraft trials in France. They burned at the stake over 400 people for being werewolves as opposed to being witches or sorcerers or whatever. And I wanted to keep the fact that he'd be four-legged, that the monster would be, you know, a hound from hell, some kind of huge, scary wolf. Rick Baker hated that idea. 
And he was able actually in the remake of The Wolfman with Benicio Del Toro to do what he wanted on my werewolf. But I, I just thought, I don't want to see that again. I want him to turn into this big monster, which made it, of course, more difficult. Well, uh, it's, you know, it still looks great today and uh, still is both funny and terrifying and kind of sad at the end, right? I mean, I hope you, really so. do, you really do kind of mix our emotions, kind of turn on a dime with it. That's not an easy easy thing to do is there a scene that you're proudest of or that you like i don't know if I'm proudest of but what i am pleased with is it's incredibly important to me that you like your characters that these terrible things are happening to otherwise who cares you know i mean if if you're invested in the people and uh, david naughton and griffin dunn's character characters you know they don't have a long time to establish they're very close friends and they have been for years that that's i'm pleased with the fact that they because of those two actors they're together on screen about eight minutes before jack is uh dead and uh you really do believe that they were good friends so i'm pleased with that and i and i don't know all every movie I've ever made, I just look at it and think that could have been better. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pleased people like it. Well, we we do for sure. And now we're gonna look, try to look and listen to a clip of Werewolf Beast Among Us from 2012. Talk to Michael Tab about that. I don't know this movie. Was it a a cable movie or a was it a release? Uh, we're about to find 14, out. Yeah, it was. It was about fourteen. It was by fourteen forty, and they do a lot of straight to DVD movies and stuff like that. And they reserved the right to release it theatrically. Um, I did go to a screening. They had they had a premiere, <laughs> and uh, then uh, there it was. And then I and then I uh, collected all the checks, and I love that part. But the uh, it started life because of uh, the Benicio del Toro, yeah, and Jack Johnson's movie, Joe Johnson's movie. Joe Johnson, uh, and, yeah, from Mighty Joe Young and all that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it started back in uh, right after that was released. They were thinking that they were going to develop another Wolfman movie, so they wanted me to come up with a take. And I was a couple of there was a couple of guys who pitched on it. I know that guys and gals, and luckily they chose mine. And I decided to go, always when you're being asked to develop a, a monster movie, you've got to ask yourself what you're going to do different from everybody who's done, done it before. And how are you going to mix things up? And how are you going to bring things that have worked in other movies, but never been used in a werewolf movie, you know, so that you're kind of meshing together things you know creep people out or or add mystery and elements like that but at the same time you're not used to seeing a werewolf that does this or has that or whatever so um my take on it was simple it was uh it's it's a murder mystery and the biggest mystery is who's the werewolf uh like most werewolf movies start and you're watching a guy get bit then he you're seeing the signs the, the you know the full moon's coming and it's all that the opening of the movie is there's already there's the werewolf is already tearing people apart and uh they they bring in all these hunters to come in to uh try and stop it and um and then you're trying to figure out who is it the only one you think it's not going to be obviously is is the hunters because they weren't there they were just brought in so and then of course you find out towards the end that one of them is actually a vampire so you have all the the powers of different things and you can have things like underworld you know i loved underworld uh by the way and i love the idea of werewolves and and, and uh, vampires fighting and um yeah and they loved it and you know there's this big um midpoint moment that i just loved writing is my favorite bit where they've rounded up everybody in the town and you're and they've imprisoned them and they're waiting as the moon is rising to see who's the one who's going to change and then, of course, it's the one person who's not imprisoned. <laughs> and then, of course, they're all sitting bait the minute he comes out. So it's, 
you know, and then and then you start to reveal and it's the person you least expect, hopefully, you know, you add red herrings to lead people in the wrong direction. So basically, I wanted to mix a murder mystery with with the history. And also, when I did the draft, my draft before the um, the director and his girlfriend rewrote the, the whole thing. But when I was doing my draft, I was my job, what, what I had come up with is a way to tie together both the Wolfman of 1941 and the Benicio del Toro one. So that, see, a lot of people thought, oh, look, I'm very big on um, history, on how things play into each other and on cinema history. And I did not want, uh, honestly, I did not want the 1941 replaced. They, the characters were named the same, so it's about a family, but I did not want people to think that because this happened, the, the 1941 version didn't happen. So I set my movie between the dates of those two movies and established that they were a continuation of the same family storyline so as not to have ever replaced the first Wolfman. Because <laughs> to me, I wanted to, res you always respect the original. You always respect where the ideas come from and then pay pay tribute and respect it. The, the, so I didn't want to do a remake. I didn't want to, you know, change things. I wanted to, I want, you always want to add to the mythology, not take away or replace. Art doesn't need to be replaced. It just needs to be built upon so that it can come into tomorrow. So that was kind was of- that a four, I glimpsed it, but was that a four-legged werewolf? Yes. Well, and how'd they do it? Was it CG or all CG, baby? <laughs> the uh, the guy had um, extensions on his arms he used for pads, so it was like crutches for their hands as they they ran with it like that. And who who directed it? Um, Louis. I never met him until the premiere. Uh... <laughs> Marneau, Louis Mar Louis Marneau, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I didn't meet him until the premiere. I tried to friend him on Facebook when I found out he was directing it. And then he got back to me the day before the premiere and, and accepted my friendship and I met him at the premiere. <laughs> I did I was like, dude, you, you should hang out. Brett. <laughs> Believe me, dude, if he had met me, he'd know there is nobody more congenial and unthreatening in this world than me. Uh, I am, I'm Mr. Happy and I just want to help and, you know, but you know, if that's what, how he had to do his work, then that's how he has to do his work. Everybody has their own method. You can't question it. You just have to respect it and give it its distance. Well, that's a writer's story, right? <laughs> yeah, being rewritten, every writer's story until we become directors, right, John? <laughs> no, even then, you, uh, <laughs> the last movie I made, Burke and Hare, mm -hmm. I, I was very, very happy with it. I had a great cast. It looked gorgeous. Everything was, it's a strange movie, but I was very pleased. The idea was these are horrible, bad men, Burke and Hare. And they do- They're grave robbers, right? Well, actually, no. They only, they were murderers is what they were. Oh. They killed people. Um, to That's sell not their, nice. To sell their cadaver. No, they're despicable. And I wanted to play them as kind of in a romantic comedy. And I was- I was very happy with the movie, and then the, it was British production. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of the produced the producers kind of fucked with it. It's still okay, but it's not the movie I made. It's they very, it. so every the, even directors get fucked with. So it's not just there you the, go. Now we're going to go to a more pleasant development story uh, with Mission of Wolf and Werewolves Within. And good night, everyone. <laughs> Vishna. Hey. So uh, you were a big game player, and you had a meeting at a game company called Ubisoft. Is that what they're called? Yeah, they're French. Ubisoft. Ubisoft. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Ubisoft. And uh, yeah. And uh, I did I did his, their women's fellowship. Uh, I, that's actually where I met Heather. <laughs> um it, it, not through that but tangentially um and you know we developed this project in their fellowship and it's from a game correct a video game yeah i the, the i mean the video game set in the middle ages but this is my take 
on that video game. How did the fans react? The game fans were they? Uh, did they take it in good humor, like the movie? Yeah, they were fine. It was. It wasn't a huge game. Um, you know, I passed over many bigger games to get to this little gem of a whodunit. Um, so I, I didn't get any terrible blowback from the uh, the whodunit gaming community. And you were telling me. Maybe it's a little on the personal side, but how, why you relate to werewolves, <laughs> why you've always liked them. Um, you know, I think I, 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 I'm, I'm like a very tall person and um, people, you know, it's like a, it's, it's like one of those things where I meet people and they're like, how, how tall are you? Um, uh, so I feel like I've never. How tall I'm, are you? I'm about six feet tall, John. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not insane. It's, it's, I'm not six six. My um, wife's six foot tall. Is she? That's lovely. I'm my sure. ex was six feet tall. Who? My ex. <laughs> but I just was always so hungry, and I always felt like I was hungry in a way that it was like so unladylike. It was just like relentless, and like I, like I could never. I, I I always felt like there was this inner wolf in me that just I mean literally I mean my parents are, are named wolf so um but you know I just couldn't consume enough and I sort of always related to that sort of wolf idea of just like just always I could eat something <laughs> did you ever did you ever think about human flesh to eat I do like meat <laughs> I'm pre-tonic, so if I have if there's no meat, it doesn't feel like I've eaten. There's a certain movie star who's available if you want to. Uh... <laughs> I think he's selling timeshares right now. <laughs> you uh, you premiered this at Berlin and Tribeca. Uh, I, I, yeah, Berlin, yes. Yeah, Berlin was a uh, by was just the um, sort of foreign rights market. Um, uh, but yeah, we, Tribeca, you tri premiered, we premiered it. it at Tribeca, kind of middle COVID, like kind of in between <laughs> rounds, in between rounds of COVID. And you have a backup as a stand-up, a background as a stand-up comic. How yeah. did that help inform your screenwriting? You think? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're gonna, I mean, I for me, writing. Um, you know, it, it helps to tell stories and take risks in front of a live audience. You really do feel when you lose a crowd. Um, it's 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 a very real and visceral thing to lose the audience. And there's nothing like bombing to learn how to keep people's <laughs> attention, <laughs> which I, I did plenty of. And you kind of used Agatha Christie sort of uh, who's the and and the sort of this Stereo, not stereotypes, but the archetypes of characters for it, right? Was that something you were? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to play with archetypes. I feel I felt like we're in this very, this moment of our history where we look we look at each other as these archetypes, like based on a few sensibilities and how we vote. Um, so it was really fun in a whodunit, and, and it's more than a whodunit. It's like a, a real accusations flying, you know, total carnage. Um, I mean, I'm not going to give away people. They all kill each other. Um, uh, but um, and die happily ever after. And die, yeah, happily. And there, there actually is a wolf. But um, I thought I'd seen this movie. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. There's versions. There's versions. Uh, there's versions of Clue in this, and um, there's you know. But I'm, yeah, I'm obsessed with Miss Marple. I think it, she's just one of the greatest characters ever. And, um, you know, I love that sort of construction. And it's there's a it's a battle royale, uh, so to speak. Um, so, you know, it was really about, you know, using those kind of archetypes where, you know, it, it says there is sort of codified as someone whose job and a color is part of their name, you know, yeah, Professor Plum or... Colonel Mustard, you know, I wanted to give them that sort of archetypical feel. And it's really fun. It's really a great kind of mashup of uh, mystery and uh, monster movie and comedy. I really enjoyed it. We're, we're kind of at the end and I didn't get to uh, 
I didn't get to all my questions and I'm sure, uh, I'm sorry, we're not gonna get to any uh, anybody else's. But let's maybe let's just end. If you have a really scary movie you've seen recently, next time, next time lose the clips. <laughs> <laughs> spoke spoken spoken uh, spoken like a good director. Uh, well, you know, people did need to see them. Unfortunately, uh, something something went awry. The curse the curse of the werewolf movie befell us. Bear werewolf uh, bear bear wolf. Never the what? <laughs> Where? Young, Frank, 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 Young Frankenstein. Mishnah, <laughs> the curse of the Mishnah wolf. No, tell him again, Danny. Werewolf. Bear. Bear wolf. <laughs> it's Gene <laughs> Wilder and Marty Feldman in Young oh. Frankenstein. <laughs> they're digging a, they're digging a body up. <laughs> All right. A scary movie to recommend. The more obscure, the better. They, you know, of recent vintage. Oh, recent. Recent. I'll start out with a Korean movie, The Host. Not that recent. Pretty good. Did that scare you, The Host? Yeah, it's a monster movie. They're gobbling people up. It's just a big monster running around. All right, I'll pick another Korean movie, The Chaser. That's really scary, a psycho killer movie. I don't know that. I'll, I'll, I'll mention Eyes Without a Face. Ah. That's not recent. Oh, you said recent? He said recent. No, oh, that's God. all right. It's good enough. Oh, I fa you mentioned 35-year-old movies. Okay. <laughs> it's, good though, right? scary. it's still really scary. John, you got one? To me, it's like yesterday. I got hundreds. I mean, um, what's the Takeshi Miike movie? Audition. Have you ever seen Audition? I'm in the middle of it. I'm watching it. Great movie. It's terrifying, but I, I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, the original Dawn of the Dead, uh, a lot of Japanese. You ever see uh, Kurneku? Mm -mm. Oh, it's great. I mean, there, there's all kinds of scary movies. And it's interesting because a lot of them are really great. Repulsion is great. Um, you ever see Possession? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Isabella Johnny. Isabella Johnny and Sam. And they they just right. the Exorcist scared me. Yeah. Any anyone else? Danny, you got a scary movie? For I was going to say The Exorcist. I, I have a bunch that were very scary when I was kids that I've rewatched and then felt ridiculous that they scared me. But I went to go see a re-release of The Exorcist. Sat in the back of the theater and they have a phone ring during the movie. Very, they cranked it up and the whole audience went like this when it's off of a phone ringing before there's any pea soup or anything a phone felt, ringing scared the crap out of the everybody pope, the pope should have given bill freakin a medal <laughs> because i'm an atheist i'm a jew i mean there's nothing in that movie don't believe in satan you know and during the movie i was scared shitless <laughs> and i think it's there's a great Danish movie called Speak No Evil that premiered at festivals recently. And it's it's not so much totally scary as it's wildly disturbing in in what it says. How, how, about, mid, how about Midsummer, which is horror and broad mm -hmm. daylight? Right. I didn't think that was scary. No. It was intense. How about it, creepy? Very intense. Yeah. And some of it was amazing. But it just went on, and and I kept saying, "When is he gonna? When are they gonna kill that guy?" I'm <laughs> waiting for the Wicker Man, you know. I'm waiting, and waiting. Just took too long. If the uh, did anybody here see Smile yet? No, uh, no. Yeah. Is it good? Scary, <laughs> scary trailer. It's, de it's definitely scary. Uh, I uh, I hadn't been scared like that since The Descent. Yeah. Oh, that's a scary movie. A scary that's movie. a scary movie. That, that all is right. Scary. Heather, are you going to jump in? No, these are all so good. I was thinking Midsummer as well, but John's list was pretty exhaustive as well. It was. Oh, perfect. there's, there's and lots. Dan, of and really Danny, good. you gave us The Exorcist. There's also another great Korean movie. I saw The Devil, which is uh, uh, I was just reminded of in a message from Patrick Flynn here that uh, is also really terrifying, very gruesome. Uh, well, thank you for sharing your uh, Halloween 
pre-Halloween uh, werewolf visions with us. And uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Blame it on blame it on me. Blame it on the werewolf. Curse of the werewolf. And again, thank you all. Thank you, Wesley, Danny, John, Mishnah, Heather. And Very Michael. nice meeting you all. Thanks for yeah, having you us. Too. Thank thank you everybody. So Thanks for Blues Brothers, John, by the way. Oh, don't, yeah. don't eat the Halloween Skittles. By the so man. <laughs> don't take apples because they have razor blades in them, my parents would tell me. <laughs> and fentanyl now, right? Fentanyl, right. <laughs>